Good afternoon, and welcome to another in our series of conversations on being church in this time of COVID-19. It is an honor to have joining me this afternoon, my colleague and friend, Corinna Gore. She is the founder and director of the Center for Earth Ethics at Union Theological Seminary in New York City. Corinna, thank you for taking the time to join me for this conversation on this afternoon. Kelly, thank you so much. I'm truly honored and uh, just really happy to be here. Happy to see you. Have been uh, have been missing seeing you um, in the course of, of regular work at Union. So here we are. Yeah, exactly. The virtues of Zoom. Uh, the, I want to jump right in because there's so much to talk about and particularly now as we are in this 50th anniversary year uh, for Earth Day. And so there are many issues concerning the health of our Earth uh, and all those it inhabited uh, that the COVID-19 crisis has really revealed to us in even more stark ways. And so one of the things, of course, it is revealed to us is in fact, uh, the reality of injustice and inequality that is really endemic to the fabric of our nation. It's also revealed to us who we are as a people, uh, not the least of which is our global interrelatedness, right? So that regardless of the walls and borders we try to erect to separate us one from another, we have discovered through this pandemic that what impacts one person on one part of the globe impacts us all. It has also revealed to us the very fragility and our impact on our environment and on our planet. So I wanna start there by asking you in general, Corinna, you've been in this work for a long time. What has this COVID crisis revealed to you or perhaps even made clear about the ongoing crisis of climate change and about our environmental health? Well, thank you so much. I agree with your framing. It is, uh, it's extraordinary to be in this time uh, together, which is indeed a time of revealing. And in many ways, uh, the coronavirus pandemic has uh, opened our eyes. It's shifted perception on a collective scale about what is most important in life. It has also laid bare some of the underlying uh, social and ecological issues. Um, for one thing, we see that those who are more vulnerable to uh, infection and uh, mortality from COVID-19 are those in more vulnerable populations. And there is a very high racial disparity in that regard. Um, we also watch our, our discourse around this. How are we talking about it? And sometimes that's described as, well, that's because of underlying health conditions. Right. Um, well, let's take a closer look at what those underlying health conditions are. It does not have to be that way. And in so many cases, we can see that um, respiratory illnesses, cardiac illnesses, um, that disproportionately affect communities of color do come from environmental injustice. They're the number one indicator of the location of a toxic facility in this country is the race of the people that live nearby. African-American children are 10 times more likely to die from asthma than white children in this country. So to take a look at that and see that uh, we have created uh, uh, these, these vulnerabilities um, by virtue of the dehumanizing of these populations and ignoring what our society has called externalities of pollution. So I, I believe that that revealing time is very important. Another thing that it has done is it has really laid uh, the impact of science, the importance of science and listening to science. And there's been a kind of trend in some ways um, understandable and in some ways uh, perhaps even righteous 
to distrust expertise, you know, experts telling us how to live our lives in a top-down way. However, science is based on the tr truth of observations of the natural world and taking politics out of it. And there are laws, whether you think of it as, as nature or creation or creator, there are laws that are higher uh, that are at work here um, when it comes to the carbon cycle, when it comes to gravity, and when it comes to the infection vectors of COVID-19. So it shows us how um, just because we want to ignore it and we don't, some people want to ignore it and not look at it, doesn't mean it's not real. So that's another thing is looking at the science. I think it's also important to see that how change is possible. There's a very good revealing here about how people will shift um, and say, you know, I, what's most important to me is the health of my family and my community. And that goes, that can't be measured by money. And, uh, and we've seen that people have taken it on themselves and acted actively for the common good. So there are many ways in which this has, has given us um, a wonderful opportunity to change uh, for the better. My goodness, Corinna, you want to dig in uh, just a little deeper into a couple of things uh, that you have said here. First of all, I love the way you talk about this as a revealing and what this has revealed to us, good and bad. Uh, and possibilities. Crisis is, also means opportunity. It's a time for opportunity. And now as these things are revealed, what's the opportunity for change? What's the opportunity to become better? One of the things that we have seen is that we as individuals, I know there's been a debate whether we're talking about what individuals can do to uh, affect a better environment and a uh, better health for our planet or what industry and corporations can do. But what we have seen uh, revealed to us during this COVID crisis when we're all sheltered in place and not driving as much is we have seen a drop, right? In admissions, we've seen a drop in uh, air pollution. We have seen wildlife come alive again. I watch foxes playing in my backyard. Uh, uh, during uh, this period of time. Mind you, I watch them from a distance. Uh, but we have seen our environment come alive in a way that it has not been alive before, suggesting that we as individuals do have an impact on our planet's health, on our own health. We, it, for, it affirms science. Can you speak to that? Absolutely. I think it is it is wonderful to see the images of, of and it's not just images, as you say, it's personal experience as well um, uh, as what we might see on TV or on the computer of wildlife coming back um, and skies being clear of, of smog. And I think that it's important for us to realize that um, there is a way for us to have that and go outside and connect with each other. The, the, the incredible nature of this problem right now in the climate crisis um, is that there has been in the last years uh, a huge um, a revolution in availability and effectiveness of clean renewable energy. And it's been quite quick just in the, in the last five years. There, um, it used to be that I think five years ago, the um, electricity from renewable energy was cheaper than electricity for fossil fuels in only 5% of the world. But today it's cheaper from renewable energy than fossil fuels in two thirds of the world. And they project that in five years, it will be that way in 100% of the world. So why are we still relying in this, in our world still relies for fossil, on, fossil fuels for energy in 80% of the world. Why? Because of the money and power of that industry that has taken a hold of our political process. So what this shows us is that we, we it, there's, a, there's a sense of, of joy and relationship and community with uh, clean air, clean water and wildlife. There is something positive and loving about that. And if we want to reach for that, we have the tools to do that now. It's actually a, a wonderful thing. And we can live, we, we, we human beings, I think sometimes there's a, a dangerous and 
and you know, sad tendency for us to think, well, we're the problem, and maybe this and this feeds into theology, of course, right. thinking about sort of is there something inherently sinful about human beings? No, it's the systems. And so one other point I want to make is that even though it's true what you say that that things are coming back to life in that way, but it's also true that emissions are still really high, even with this shelter in place. And there have been some studies showing that. Well, why? Where are they coming from? Because they're so built into the systems that it's not just about individual behavior. So now we have a chance to really see the agency of us as a people in engage with those systems to make those changes, which can lead to a much better world. But we have to be vigilant and careful because in this time of crisis, it's not just the, the good that rises up. It's also, there are also predatory forces that wanna take advantage and try to get more power. So we're in a really important time. And I, I'm so happy that you and so many other incredible thinkers and leaders are, are reaching out to people to have these conversations so that we can do that together. Good. I want to say something, uh, spend a little time with these predatory forces in, in a different way. Uh, again, that is in relationship to environmental injustice, as you laid out so clearly uh, earlier. And so we have people, as you suggested, the communities that are most vulnerable to COVID fatalities and this COVID virus are also the communities that are most vulnerable to living under conditions of pollution and uh, unhealthy environmental conditions. And it's no accident, obviously, that those are people of color. One gentleman in Port Arthur said that, you know, we feel like we are living in sacrifice zones, that we have been sacrificed. Uh, uh, and so what we see, I think, through this COVID crisis, what's revealed unto us is that these people who have been most vulnerable are now becoming the persons who are now disposable. We even see that as we began this move, this movement has begun to open up and reopen states. In doing that, you are again putting the most vulnerable at a high risk. And so that it does seem that not only are we talking about sacrifice zones, but we are also talking about disposable people. What can the environmental movement, the uh, ecological justice movement, how can they begin to get involved and help us in terms of seeing the interrelationship between we should just say white races, white supremacy, the injustice of that, and our environment. Well, thank you. Um, first, let me say that there, um, you mentioned before the 50th anniversary of Earth Day was recently. And Earth Day, you know, it's not just one of these random sort of Hallmark card type, you know, designated days uh, out of nowhere. It came in uh, out of, awareness um, that came from different things, um, the effect of, of these new toxic chemicals that came out of the Industrial Revolution, um, this sort of rapidification um, of, of those processes and, and, uh, and pollution and depletion of the natural world that was starting to build in those years. And there were people who were speaking out against it. And there was also, of course, um, the photo from, from from space of the earth for the first time um, in which people could really see the image uh, of, of this, this, this home that we share. And, um, and it does have a thin shell of an atmosphere. We look up from where we are down here and it looks limitless, but it's a thin shell of atmosphere and it becomes filled. And the aggregate effect of all of, all of those, um, uh, of all that pollution is changing the weather, weather patterns. But the same, activity on a local level creates ambient pollution that hurts the people nearby. So where are those toxic facilities located? They're located in the places where the people have been 
deprived of the uh, political and financial power and strings to pull to resist it. And that has always involved racism. And we can, we can see the first Earth Day also led to incredible legislation, not just Earth Day, it was the consciousness behind Earth Day, but the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the NEPA, uh, National Environmental Policy Act. These are all things that, in the creation of the EPA, and, and people, Nixon at the time saw how many, how many people came out um, with the Earth consciousness and awareness around Earth Day. And so um, those are laws that have been in place to help protect uh, the local air and water as well as the aggregate effect. And right now we live in a time and we know that there's a resurgence of a certain kind of particularly toxic racism of, of white nationalism. And part, part of that, there are people who are riding that in order to gut these laws, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Endangered Species Act, NEPA, which as it is, they're not even really adequate to do the job. There's been a kind of re you know, regulatory capture, they say, of the agencies that are de designed to implement them. So it's been already problematic. But one more thing I wanna say about it, as we live in this time, because the, the, the Trump administration, um, EPA, declared as part of COVID-19 that they were gonna suspend enforcement of environmental regulations. What that is, it's, it's unethical, it's insane. Um, it's uh, because what that would mean is exactly the people who are already vul more vulnerable to um, COVID-19 because of the health conditions of living near those to toxic sites will then have even less protection for when, for when uh, you know, those people controlling those sites, corporations controlling those sites wanna say, eh, you know what, don't worry about it. Let's just turn the valve wide open on all this ambient pollution and water pollution and let it go. Those are the people that are gonna be the most harmed. So there's that, there's many other rollbacks that are, that are in the works um, under this administration. And just like the people in the late 60s and early 70s fought so hard for those, we have to fight super hard to prevent the rollbacks and to, and to actually have good enforcement. And one other thing I wanna say is that there has been leadership from the front lines, from communities of color, from the people and communities that are most affected by this for a long time. To cite one example, in 1982 in Warren County, North Carolina, there, were, there was a, a PCB toxic landfill, yet another toxic site going in a community of color and people laid down in the road to stop it. Um, people put their bodies on the line to stop it. There are environmental, the Standing Rock Sioux with the Dakota Access Pipeline um, stood up to stop it. You know, there are, and the leadership is coming from these communities. It doesn't always prevail. Um, but uh, what I love that Martin Luther King quote that I believe unarmed truth uh, will, will triumph. Even if you fail at the time, truth is stronger than injustice. And there's a building sense that if we not only, we lift up those communities and stand with them, then we will be able to prevail because this is really about truth. What, what they're doing is based on a lie, a lie of separation, a lie of separation that the air and water is separate from human beings and a lie about inequality, that some people are worth more than others. Both those things are lies and they're tied together and we now have the chance to really push back. So well said. <laughs> and you know, I'm reminded as you say that, I think Greta Thornburg was asked uh, at one point, uh, what can we do? And she just, she simply said, tell the truth. Uh, duh, and so, if we tell the truth about our environment, we are telling the truth about this wider kind of crises that we are all engaged in that just said what you just said, that one group of people is more significant than another group of people and that we aren't all interrelated, not only as human beings, but that we are interrelated as creatures on this planet. And that's what uh, COVID is revealing to us so clearly that we are all a part of one uh, creation. Uh, and you were right in pointing out, and one of the things that we can all become more involved in is an awareness of the kind of policy rollbacks that are occurring. And there are activists and people of color who are quite pointing out that the Trump administration's move to suspend enforcement of US environmental laws is playing a role in the vulnerability of various communities 
to the COVID crisis. So as we think about that, I want us to move now toward the role that faith communities can play. As we frame that conversation, I want to begin with something you said. And in several times that I've seen you speak and in interviews, you suggested that the cause of our Earth's destruction is, has to do with our values and that this is a moral issue. Can you speak to that? Yes, uh, we have um, allowed a ruling paradigm to operate in this, in this country. And we live in a country, the United States of America right now, that has an outsized uh, impact on the world. So that, um, that doesn't mean we're exceptional, we're better than everybody else, but it does mean that we need to really think hard about our responsibility on that global level. Uh, because uh, it does have an, an impact on, on the whole world in that way. What I'm talking about in terms of the paradigm, um, uh, it's an economic development paradigm um, that is about short-term monetary gain. So no matter the pollution, no matter the depletion of things we call resources like water, forests, and the like, uh, soil, um, no matter the inequality uh, and, and no matter the positive benefit that we would get from long-term um, care, a, a culture of care that would in fact maybe preserve a forest for a community to enjoy, which would be better for their health and culture rather than turn it into um, lots of paper products right away for that short-term gain. So these, the most common measurement of this is uh, GDP, um, gross domestic pop product. We've all heard economic growth lifted up. And you know, here's where I think there's a, uh, I think, religion, faith, and spirituality is incredibly central to all of this um, because it is, in some ways, it has been able to mask this paradigm mm. because there are distortions of theology. And Kelly, you've written more eloquently than anyone about this. There is bad theology that has been ingrained in secular society and in the parlance with which we talk about what we value and why. And so one of the theologians, I really like uh, is Cynthia Mo Labeda, um, who's a union um, person um, and studied with Larry Rasmussen, wonderful eco theologian uh, at Union for a long time as well. And I, I really love the way she writes about structural evil and the concept of, of structural evil. One of the most important characteristics is that it easily masquerades as good. Yes. So a lot of when people lift up this economic development paradigm, they're saying, this is creating jobs, this is creating economic growth, this is ending poverty, and yet it is not. It is, it's absolutely not. It's a mask and it's a lie because in fact, what's happening is just like GDP doesn't measure those things I mentioned, the, the gap in inequality is huge. All of the monetary benefits short term go to a tiny amount of people. And then those who suffer from the degradation of the environment around them and from being extracted from their labor, their community, their culture, their food system, everything are the ones that suffer the health consequences. So we need to look deeply in our, in our faith traditions, our religious traditions. What about um, our, the way that we have, have lived and taught uh, our, our religious values has enabled this? Is it an anthropocentric that only human beings are are, are important. Um, there's a serious conversation to be had about that because human beings themselves are certainly also suffering from this. But also the short term, who is in the, who is in the circle of moral concern that we're talking about? Because increasingly what we have allowed is for the circle of moral of concern to be the markets. And we can see now That's as right. people are suffering and hurting full of anxiety and the stock market goes up, the markets aren't reflecting how people live their lives and what's most valuable and important. So I think that um, it's, it's, it's about our values. 
Uh, and it's it's really on all of us, and particularly faith leaders. And you're a wonderful faith leader, and I imagine many of, of your viewers and listeners and followers are. So I know, and there's so much great work being done. Let me say, I'm 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 not saying anything that hasn't been said, but I just want to echo that this is I think where it's at is to step up and really um, really change this conversation around values. I like this image of a circle of moral concern. <laughs> and who's in that circle of moral concern? And what's perhaps not ironic, what is so revealing, and again, this COVID crisis has revealed it, that the people that are in the, outside of the circle of moral concern are the people that are most vulnerable to the environmental kind of health conditions that are living in environmentally unhealthy situations that are most vulnerable to the uh, disease of our planet, of our earth. And we are also seeing, aren't we, that even as we navigate our way through this COVID crisis and talking about reopening and et cetera, et cetera, who's within the circle of moral concern and who's not. Uh, to, and it speaks to our values. And again, you are very correct to point out how it's market driven. Uh, uh, what's so interesting is that all of this is interrelated so that our concern for our planet and our planet's health is about as well our concern for each other. And it has to do with economic injustice, racial injustice, uh, et cetera. So this is a moral issue. And so as we, oh my goodness, Corinna, we could go on forever. So but we're coming to an end. So as we come to this end and we think about this as a moral issue, a, a issue uh, for faith communities uh, to be concerned about, what is it that you would want to leave us with what would you like to see faith communities doing? What's our call to action uh, uh, in terms of understanding the complex realities of our concern for our earth? I think that we, all of the world's religious and spiritual traditions, and, and we include very much so indigenous traditions, uh, wisdom traditions in that, of course, um, in, especially with this issue, have a teaching about the oneness of, of life, the essential unity of life. There are no externalities. This language that came from a, a certain branch of, of economics about externalities, that it's not important to your business plan. So just um, you know, let it go and pretend it doesn't exist. Um, and then we have had uh, business, people say government should be more like business. So we've ceded a lot of our civic sphere, sphere to that mentality. There are no externalities. Uh, when um, Martin Luther King says injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, it's similar in meaning to Thich Nhat Hanh saying, we are here to awaken to the illusion of our separation. Mm. So we need to really think about that. It's not just that it's not fair to the people that are getting the short end of the stick. It's that it hurts the health of the whole. And so how do we, how do we voice that and live that in a way that we understand just as, you know, a COVID outbreak in China um, is going to wind up being a COVID outbreak in Manhattan. Um, ch chopping down the Amazon rainforest um, is going to wind up with stronger storms and, and, and droughts and heat waves and wildfires in the United States. Uh, melting ice at the poles causes rising sea level in places like Bangladesh. You know, we're, we're meant to have uh, almost, I mean, the numbers is in the hundreds of millions of refugees um, uh, if, we, if we do not act on this. So how do we, how do we bring our consciousness and articulate for those who are not yet there, what this means, this unity of life and how it is a beautiful and strengthening thing. It is, it's not a threatening thing. This is not about fear. Just like wearing a mask is not about fear. It's about respect. It's about love. It's about courage. How do we understand that caring 
for the whole is actually self-care. So I believe that now we have uh, a charge among us to, um, to think not only how we bring our own consciousness to that place, but how do we communicate it in a way that is not, um, not finger pointing. Uh, we have a lot of judgment out there, a lot of misinformation, a lot of anxiety and polarization. How do we communicate it in a way that we can really reach people and bring this moment uh, to a time of transformation? What a place to stop. We have been awakened to the illusion of our separation. Thank you, Corinna, for joining me in this important conversation, which I hope for many is just the beginning and to dig deeper and to understand the realities of what it means for us to be together on this planet and to live in a healthy relationship with it and hence with one another. Thank you, Corinna. I know you and I will have many more conversations to come. I thank you for this conversation, but more than that, I thank you for your work. Thank you all for joining us. Thank and you. I invite you. Thank you. And invite you for future conversations of being church in the time of COVID-19. Thank you. <laughs>